The Whitney Reynolds Show is supported by Reach Out Community Center. Reach out and help one child at a time. The boogeyman is real, and he lives on the net. He lived in my computer, and he lives in yours. Hi, I'm Whitney Reynolds, and today's topic is online predators. What exactly is that, and what do you need to keep an eye out for? We are learning this all through one person's courageous story. You're watching The Whitney Reynolds Show. In January of 2002, Alicia Kosakevich was taken from her home in Pittsburgh by a man she'd only met online. She lives today to tell the story and help other kids that could be targets for online predators. Alicia, thank you so much for coming on. I know this is a tough topic and I want to work in your comfort zone. So take us back to 2002. Let's go, let's go right to the meat of it. You were online. You developed a profile online, it was a chat room? Well, when I was 13 years old, it was really the beginning of online social networking, of kids being in chat rooms. It was very new, and I was a very shy, quiet, typical kid, and I got online and started talking to my friends from school, because that's where they all were. They didn't want to go outside anymore. They didn't want to go to the park or the mall or the movies. They wanted to stay indoors and stay online. So to maintain my friendships, I broke down and got a screen name and started talking to my friends from school who would introduce me to their friends and their friends and their, fr their friends until I was in a realm of people I really didn't know, but we all felt connected because it could be traced back to that one person. So it's kind of one of those things that you join up, you start meeting everyone. It's almost like a social social kind of network. You were getting to know people around your age. It was. It, it was comforting because I was somebody who was so shy, who was kind of afraid of their own voice in a way. And to be able to type what I wanted to say instead of having to say it out loud was a very comforting thing. And also another great, uh, another great area is the fact that the kids who were the popular kids or the kids who weren't the popular kids, everybody was able to get along together. It was kind of like a middle school <sighs> utopia, which is pretty much impossible. So it felt like a very comfortable, safe space. So safe is the key word there, because it felt safe. You were in the comfort of your home. You, it was a family computer. So tell us how you met your online predator, because it wasn't like he just came out of saying, I'm an older man, I want to come take you to my house. It was one of those things that was very tricky. Yeah, we started talking online and I had assumed, to be honest, I assumed that he was somebody around my age because I was a trusting kid and he was talking to me. Why would somebody who was older talk to a kid? Right. That certainly didn't make any sense to me. And you have to remember in 2002, there were no internet safety seminars. There was no talk really of internet predators. It wasn't something that was in anybody's head and it certainly wasn't in mine. And he behaved as though he was somebody my age, interested in the same things that I was. And what older man would be interested in things like Spice Girls, a boy would in fact. But. Right. <laughs> right, so he kind of got to your level, made you feel very comfortable. And did he immediately reveal himself? No, he, I did not know who he was until we, he, I actually saw him in person. Oh, wow. So you did not know he was a man or older? No. Oh, wow. So you're chatting online, and this person says, I want to meet. Now, I want to clear up something, because this is, I think, a stereotype. Broken home, father not around, that's not your case. Not at all, and it's very much a stereotype. I came from a very happy, loving family, mom, dad, older brother, and was at, we were actually having a family dinner on New Year's Day 2002 when all this happened. Wow. So you had a family dinner. The guy had already messaged you and said, I want to meet you. When that, when he said, you know, in hindsight, as always, you can always look back and say, oh, I should have maybe seen this. But did he just come out and say, I'm going to pick you up? Because that would have been like, you are no 13-year-old girl. What, how did he approach that? 
Well, it's difficult. I have very little, it's kind of a Swiss cheese memory of it all. There's a term, and it's a very important term that people really need to understand, and that term's grooming. And that's how this all happened. That is what he did to me. And through the process of grooming, he held me captive long before he ever had his hands on me. Mm -hmm. And it's something that it's something that's so simple. It's really just being a child's friend, making them feel beautiful and special and important and unique, and telling them what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. Their parents tell them what they need to hear. Their teachers tell them what they need to hear. Sometimes their friends tell them what they need to hear. And to have somebody who's there all the time and who's always on your side, it's, it's very comforting. Right. And it seems like that's what a friend is. If I told you if I said, define a friend, that may be the very words that you would use. And through this process, he separated me from my, myself. Grooming can be likened to brainwashing, mind control. So a term that I guess we should look out for, what you're saying is grooming, is where they get you basically on their team as a best friend, where you kind of lose your own identity. Exactly. It's very much like brainwashing and taking you apart bit by bit and turning you into who this person wants you to be. Was there ever a moment in the talking to him online that you felt like, this is getting a little too weird? Not that I remember. Okay. So dinner, 2002, New Year's Day, how did you know that he was outside? He messaged you? Or was this like plan that you were gonna go meet him? From what I remember is we were having a family meal and mom was preparing the dessert. Mm. And I said that I had a stomach ache and that I was going to go upstairs to lay down. And I walked out my front door and oh. I left it open just a little bit because I was planning on coming right back. And to show you how effective grooming is, I'm somebody who's scared of the dark. I hate the cold with a passion and I never went outside alone after dark. Yet, New Year's Day 2002, coldest, darkest, iciest night. I walk out my front door and walk up the block just, just a bit. Wow. So you all of a sudden he re reveals himself. You see that he's an older man. Were you so far brainwashed at that time that it was, okay, let's go? Or did you immediately know something was wrong? I want to go home. Well, what happened was I walked up the block and I stood there for a minute and I thought, this little voice finally spoke up, the voice that I wish I had, had spoken up so much sooner, finally spoke up and said, Alicia, what are you doing? This is stupid. And I went to turn around and start walking back home. And then I heard my name being called. And next thing I knew, I was in a car. And this man was squeezing my hand so tightly that I thought it was broken. And he was barking commands at me. Be good, be quiet, the trunk's cleaned out for you. Oh, that just gave me chill bumps just even. And you were 13 years old. I was 13. That is terrifying. That is one of those moments that we hope no one that we know or even ever experiences that. So you're in his car. Did it feel like the longest road trip of your life? Because you had no idea where you were going. And as a 13 year old hearing the trunks cleaned out for you, did you think death? Did you think he That's was just going to you? the only thing yeah. I could think of was I'd see the movies, that's what ends up right. in the cars or, or, the, or in the trunks or the bodies. So you immediately had that fear of, wow, th this could be my end. Yes, he's going to kill me. And he started to drive and drive and drive. And it was so long and I kept looking out at the road signs trying to figure out where I was and figure out how to get home and, and thinking about my family and just being more terrified than you could ever put into words. Did any of your friends know you were going to meet this guy? No, my friends had no idea. So really no one knew, and I'm sure that was playing in your head as well. No one knows where I'm at. Exactly, this, is, this may very well be the end of me. So he takes you across state lines and you pull up to a home. Did he blindfold you at any point? It was just forced with the hand for what you can remember? I just remember be, I, 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 it's strange because I, I can't remember a whole lot of what happened. I remember the sounds or the feelings associated with it, but not, so it's, 
really yeah. weird. Um, but so you get to his house, and where what happens from there? He took me down into the basement, down these winding, long, long stairs, and opened a door, and inside was what can best be described as a dungeon. And I had no idea of what it was. It was just a really terrifying place, and it looked like there were things all over the wall that were meant to cause pain. And he propped me up on a table, and he told me that this is going to be hard for you. It's okay. Cry. I don't even know what to say. I feel it for you right now. I feel like I'm in that moment, and I know as I mentioned earlier, this is hard. When you, when you were on the table and he said cry, could you even have a sense of emotion at that point? I remember thinking that if I cried, it was giving into what he wanted hmm. and playing into his game, but I still also really wanted to cry. You'd already had that feeling of this is the end of me, so now I'm just gonna do whatever I can while I'm still here. Exactly, and I knew that he was going to kill me. And for those four days, I did whatever I had to do to survive because I knew that. Did you beg for your life at any point? Did you say, don't, don't touch me that way? Or were you afraid of what more he would do? I fought back once and ended up with a broken nose. So over the course of four days, he raped you, tortured you with the things on the wall. Did he feed you? He fed me the last day. It's amazing the questions that people will ask you after something like this happens. Very insensitive, very naive, just don't get it. Right. And one of the things that people would ask is that because he had fed me and then he left for work, people would say, oh. He left for work. Why didn't you scream? Why didn't you yell? Why didn't you try to jump out the window? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? And for me, I never really knew if he was gone or not. I didn't know if he was just standing right beyond the door waiting to hear me scream or yell or cause a problem for him. And that's when I figured he would, would kill me. And before he fed me, he said, I'm beginning to like you too much. Tonight we're going to go for a ride. And that could only mean one thing to me. It meant that he was going to, to kill me. But that was also the day that I was rescued. What an incredible moment that must have been. It was the FBI gave me a second chance at life. You know, you have quite the story and you are able to live and tell it. Let's go ahead and talk about caution tips for everyone at home. A lot has changed since 2002. Like you mentioned earlier, there are awareness groups, but what are some things that you can definitely pass on to our viewers? Well, I feel one thing that's so important. One thing I do in my presentation is I show a photo of me sitting at a computer when I was 13 years old. And I show this to the kids, even though it is a terrible photo of me. I show it to the kids so they can look at it and go, oh, wait a minute, I'm just like her. And they all agree that if I came in and sat down in a room with them, that I would just be another face in the crowd. They wouldn't think that something truly terrible would happen to me just because I was, I was just like them. Right. So your, your point with that is it can happen to anybody. It can. And if it can happen to me, it can happen to you, and it can happen to your children. And that's so important for parents to know because they often think that, well, you're in a better area. That doesn't happen around here. My child's a good child. And right. it's important to know that it happens to good kids. It happens to good kids a lot because the good kids are the ones who are the quiet, curious child. Right. So keep an eye out if you're a parent on what your kids are doing online. Do you recommend parental monitoring? They have those devices where people, parents can watch what's going on. I absolutely do. I think all parents should have it. It's sad. I do parent seminars and a lot of times I come away with that parents want to be their child's friend. They don't want to protect them. That doesn't come first. Friendship comes first. And first and foremost, you must keep your child safe. So yes, I do promote the monitoring software. And you don't have to look at it every day. 
Okay. I really suggest you don't look at it every day. <laughs> There's things about your kids that you don't really need to know. But if your child does go missing, if they're being cyberbullied, if they're being blackmailed, if they're being sextorted, you have a blueprint of what happened and possible roadmap to where they are. When you were abducted, did it immediately come into your parents' mind that it was probably through someone online, or did they think you were taken somewhere in Pittsburgh? My parents had no idea. I just, it's hard to even think about it because we were just having a family meal and poof, yeah. their daughter was gone. So how did they connect the dots that it was online? My dad actually connected it. He realized that I'd spent a lot of time on the computer and he just had this moment of dad instinct where he, he knew. Part of the way you were saved is a guy actually spoke up that was friends with the guy that abducted you. And for people that maybe hear something, even if your child's not the one abducted, but even if it sounds like a crazy story, believe it and tell someone because that's how ultimately they caught on that you were there. Exactly. He seen a video of me being abused mm. by this man and he contacted the FBI and because of that they were able to track him down and save my life. Hearing that story or seeing a video like that you would almost think it was fake and so if he wouldn't have you know, said something then who knows what would have happened. So if people hear something they should definitely tell even if it's a child. If you hear that something fishy is going on go ahead and tell your parents. Exactly, and on social networking sites, we see that a lot where people will post something and we find out that it was just a hoax. But on the off chance that it's not, please report it. And there's so many more options these days. It's not just chat rooms, it is social media. Any recommendations for parents with that? Well, it's difficult because now we used to say keep your computer in your family room or in a room that your parents are walking through a lot. But now it's on our social, it's on our devices, it's on our mobile devices, it's, it's on our laptops, it's on our iPads, it's everywhere. You can't really keep kids away from the internet for a period of time. Right. And it's so important to keep track of what they're doing. Go through their phone. Don't give them the liberty. I used to sell phones, actually, and parents would come up and they'd give me a phone and they'd be like, oh, I, don't, I don't know the password, it's my kid's phone. <laughs> like, you need to know the password to your right. child's phone. You need to really keep track of what your kids are doing. They're living in a world where sexting is normal. Oh, it doesn't make it right. <laughs> right. But it's normal. They're living in a world where they're socialized to think that this is what you're supposed to do. Any additional tips that you would say that maybe we haven't covered? Speaking out, keep an eye on your kids. Social media, a certain age. Do you think there should be an age for kids when they can get online? I do. I think there should certainly be an age. I don't know quite what that age should be. Right. I think a lot of adult, adults aren't even <laughs> mature enough to be on it at this point. But kid, the thing is that kids are going to be on it. There's no age limit. You don't have to send in your ID. There's nothing right. that's going to prevent them from being on it. So they're going to be on it. You need to teach them that there's bad things that can happen and that there are consequences. Things that might not be as on the extreme end of the spectrum is my story, but things that are just as life-threatening. I know when I was a little girl, stranger danger was the big thing. Don't wear anything with your name on it. And now I feel like as we're progressing, it is now this online movement where kids really need to be safe. And they're sharing so much information right. automatically. Another thing that kids need to be really careful about is what they choose is their screen name, their username, their handle, because mm. it kind of puts a spotlight on you. If you say, cute cheerleader 13, you may be a very cute cheerleader and you might be 13 and that's a perfectly innocent, cute screen name, but the problem is that it will put a spotlight on you for predators. Absolutely. Well, those are great tips. It's now time for your social sizzle. I'm here with Billy Deck at Underground. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. Now, we're talking about a very serious issue today, online yes. predators, and you are really a social media guru when it comes to promoting yourself and your businesses. Yeah. And the biggest thing is how to do it safely. How would you recommend to do that? Well, I always tell people that don't post anything that you wouldn't share in, uh, you know, in person. If you were at a party, if you wouldn't tell someone something or you wouldn't show them that picture, don't do it at all. Um, the other thing is, these days, I'm starting to think you really have to make choices about what is personal and what's private. So how do you differentiate what's personal and private? Well, again, if you don't want to hold something out to the world, 
then you just shouldn't post it on social media. And just recently, you know, I had a baby 17 uh, months ago. Congrats the first, again. Thank you. The first year, of course, I was posting pictures like every minute of every day. And then what happened was uh, followers were starting to uh, say hi to him at grocery stores and take pictures with him and sort of grab him at the park. and uh, With his name. and Knowing his name. Uh, and yeah. uh, sometimes he'd be with a nanny or his mom or myself. And it was really sort of shocking and frightening. So just as of three weeks ago, I stopped posting him uh, going forward at all. Was there any certain thing besides those people that were coming up saying his name? Or it just kind of was this aha it was, moment? It was pure... Uh, it was purely the fact that I had no idea who they were. It was just the fact that they were strangers in person. There was a connection online in a very instantaneous and organic way, but yet they were in fact strangers. And it was, it doesn't, it doesn't hit you until they grab your baby and then they take a camera and they go like that. Oh my goodness! I would never and, want to experience yeah, that. It was, it was really rough. So. Not that anything's bad or anything bad happened, right. and there wasn't anything wrong with the people that did that. Um, but I just, I just know that that's where I was violating my own rule. Okay. So if I have security uh, situations and practices in place with my child, I shouldn't just throw them out to the world. Do you ever recommend? I know for myself and maybe some others. I don't check into a place until I'm leaving. I don't either. Okay, so that's the, would you recommend that? So, yes. then people know where you are. I also don't want people to know when I'm not home or I'm home or, um, yeah, something yeah. about that. And it, I don't think it actually matters. I think if you enjoy your meal and then you say, I just enjoyed this meal, but you've moved on, that's okay. Right. Because I do want to give credit to the wonderful chefs and servers and people at these different venues, whether right. it's a clothing store or a food uh, establishment. But um, sometimes doing it right then and there is, again, sort of opening up private situations to right. the public. Well, now it's time for our Chicago Central. This is where we normally take it to the streets of Chicago to have everyday people weigh in. Well, today we had people write in questions to Alicia since we have the expert right here with us. Thanks for staying with us today. Your story has really been touching. Thank you for having me on. So we broke down kind of what went on, and it was very, very tough to go through that. But now we have a few more questions that people want to know about. How long did it take you to recover? That's a difficult question because... Recovery is a, an ongoing process. I don't, I have kids often ask me, when did you get better? It's like it was getting over a common cold and it's not that way. I still have my dark days. Do you worry that your, your online predator will come back after he gets out of jail or prison? I'm asked that question a lot and it's usually by kids because now they can identify the predator. They understand that, okay, here is somebody that we need to protect ourselves from. And I tell them that he's not that important. He's behind bars. He's being punished. Who we need to focus on, who I focus on, are all the other predators out there. Yes, you do. Now, I know the answer to this next question, but it's, do you get online today? <laughs> You're very social. Yes, I do get online. I find that it's a great way to spread the word with Alicia's project and getting the word out there and being able to talk to kids and reach out to kids on a level that they can really understand. Yeah, you are definitely spreading the word. You do go in the schools as well and do a lot of education with the kids. And lastly, what is in your future? Ta-da! <laughs> It was like, that's a fun question. That is a fun question. So, I mean, school-wise, you're going to school. I just started graduate school. I'm working on my forensic psychology degree at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. Just started about in the fourth week, and uh, midterms are happening all of a sudden, so I don't know where <laughs> those came from quite. Uh, getting used to Chicago, moved here about four months ago, and i got to say, I really, I love the city. I fell in love with it while visiting it, and... I'm really so happy to be here and really looking forward to sharing my message with Chicagoland, reaching out and talking to the kids in schools and talking to the parents and local law enforcement and really trying to get the message out there. Before I started speaking out, my dad sat me down and he said, Alicia, you know, you might not know the difference that you make, 
you may never know because it's preventative. It may not be a story like yours where it's all over the news. Are you okay with not feeling like a superhero? And I said absolutely because it's always been about reaching the one child, the one family, the one person. Because to save a life is to change the world. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hello, thank you for inviting me to speak today. My name is Alicia Kozakevich. A Pittsburgh resident, I am 19 years old and a sophomore in college. And for the benefit of those of you who don't know, don't remember those headlines, I am that 13-year-old girl who was lured by an internet predator, transported across state lines to Virginia, in fact, not so very far from here, and enslaved by a sadistic pedophile monster. The authorities told my parents that the odds were a million to one against my recovery. But I was the exception. I got the miracle. I was rescued. So why me? Because I was blessed by the simple fact that I live in Pittsburgh, where one of the very best cybercrime task forces was created. And because I was enslaved in Virginia, where one of the best internet crimes against children task force, or ICATS, exists. Because they had the training, the knowledge, and the expertise to find that needle in the haystack. That was a lost little girl. That was me. The Whitney Reynolds Show is supported by Reach Out Community Center. Reach out and help one child at a time.